Welcome to the Faculty Forum online broadcast, which allows alumni to interact with MIT experts about their cutting edge research and timely topics. I am Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I will be your moderator today. To participate, first put a username and your location into your computer, then simply type your question at the bottom of your screen. While we will not be able to cover every question over the next half hour, we will do our best to address as many questions as possible. Our speaker today is Steve Van Evera, the Ford International Professor in the Department of Political Science at MIT. He also is chair of the Tobin Project International Working Group, associate director of the MIT Center for International Studies, and a member of the MIT Security Studies Program. A link to his bio will appear on your screen. Welcome, Professor Van Evera. Uh, to start, I'd like to ask you to pro provide us with a little bit of context for our program today by briefly discussing your work in the area of conflict and some of the root causes of war. First, I just want to say it's great to be here to share thoughts with the MIT alums. It's been an honor to teach on MIT students these last 20 years, and it's great to share thoughts with the alum today. Um, my work on the causes of war uh, uh, talks, uh, the, uh, the main idea that I would draw from it that's relevant to today is on the question of power and how shapes of power or different arrangements of power affect the, uh, the likelihood of war in the world. I wrote a book called uh, Power and the Roots of Conflict, which is about how uh, the type and nature and uh, configuration of power in the world can shape, can proclive things toward either war or peace. And one key thing I talked about in that book was the nuclear revolution and how nuclear weapons have changed the world. Um, they've had both good and bad effects, and in that book I elaborated on their effects, and uh, in today's presentation on U.S. foreign policy, I also want to talk a little bit about how the nuclear revolution, meaning the um, development of nuclear weapons and their, and their uh, spread to num a number of countries, has really changed American interests, changed the nature of the threats the U.S. faces, and therefore, in my mind, ought to change our, our policy responses. So what do you think our, what, can you say a little bit more about what our situation is today uh, and where we are and whether or not there are any parallels from the past that might inform how we deal with the current situation? Well, my view is that the current security situation is very different from the security situation the U.S. faced during the first, say, couple hundred years of America's existence. During the first 200 years, especially during the years from, like, 1917 to 1991, when the U.S. faced the Germans, the Germans, and then the Soviets. Back in those days, the primary problem we faced was that a single state might uh, dominate Eurasia. It might go on a rampage, conquer its neighbors, assemble a huge industrial base from which it could then uh, harvest a huge military uh, apparatus, and that military apparatus would be strong enough to cross the Atlantic and threaten us. And that that danger was the main reason the U.S. joined World War One to stop. Germany from conquering Europe, and then it was again the main reason the U.S. Uh, fought to stop Hitler. Our real reason for doing that was not ideology, it was fear of German power if Germany wasn't checked. And then again in the Cold War, the primary U.S. fear was that if the Soviet Union wasn't checked, it too could dominate this whole industrial area running from the Atlantic to Japan and have enough strength then to threaten the U.S. Um, so that was the primary, primary threat. Today, I think nuclear weapons have made that whole scenario completely obsolete. No great power today is going to conquer any other great power if it has a secure nuclear arsenal. It's not going to happen. And it's very easy to maintain a secure nuclear arsenal, even against another country that has a much bigger GDP or a much more powerful military establishment. Mm -hmm. um, nuclear weapons, in other words, are essentially, between states, defensive weapons. They make conquest much harder. Therefore, for example, if China, even if China, continues to grow economically and uh, develops a bigger economy than ours, which I think it's going to in, in coming, you know, not too soon, in the, not too far in the future. And even if they develop a large nuclear establishment, which they don't have today, they have a very small, strangely small nuclear force, but even if they build a big one, there's just no plausible scenario under which they can threaten our secure deterrent. And if they can't do that, they can't conquer us. And this is the upside of nuclear weapons, that they really take off the table this, this nightmare that we have lived with and waged war to prevent for so many years. On the other hand, the nuclear revolution has raised major new dangers, and the 
primary danger is that of terror with weapons of mass destruction. The danger is that states will prove unable to be secure custodians of these weapons or these materials or this knowledge, all three of them, and that in the end, nuclear weapons will leak out to non-deterrable actors, as we say in foreign policy, to terrorists or to psychopaths, uh, people who cannot be uh, deterred from using them by the normal threat of retaliation. Uh, the way we've prevented nuclear weapons from being used since 1945 is the threat of a like response to the address of the person who sent them. And that's the only way that we've really worked out that, that works reliably to prevent this nightmare from happening. But it won't work with uh, nihilistic uh, terrorists like Al-Qaeda or um, religiously driven groups like Om Shinrikyo, the group that attacked in Japan uh, 18 years ago. So this, nuclear weapons, are their Jane is faced. They've, they've solved one problem, the problem of, or the danger that uh, another great power might conquer the U.S. But they've raised another one, another monstrous problem, the danger of WMD terror, or nuclear terror. Mm -hmm. So listening to you talk about terrorists um, takes me in a slightly different direction, uh, terrorists and nuclear weapons, because I think uh, some of the fear around nuclear power plants has to do with the material getting in the hands of the wrong people and being used for ill purposes. And, uh, and yet I also have a hunch that nuclear power is an important component of uh, global climate management or change. How do, these, how do these same principles of power and relationship and balance of power come into play in the global climate change scenario. Raising nuclear power, you really raise a very interesting sort of triangle of problems. Nuclear uh, power plants being, as you say, the uh, you know, infrastructure that can create uh, weapons, usable materials, plutonium, uh, can be used for weapons once it's been run through a, a reactor. Um, at the same time, it's useful for energy. Uh, uh, nuclear, nuclear energy is one of the you know, non uh, non-climate change uh, energy sources. And that raises, by the way, a, a third major area of U.S. interest that I think is different from the past, which is that, um, speaking of climate change, we have now a huge threat to the global commons, which we did not face before. To the global commons, meaning to things that the human race possesses in common and n depends on in common. Most importantly, the climate, but really, in a larger sense, the natural world. And perhaps in other ways, too, the global financial system. We've now learned we have an interconnected global financial system, which we used to think we know how to manage, and now I think increasingly we, we maybe don't know how to manage. Or other, uh, shall we say, things we hold in common, like the global public health system, that um, uh, uh, common measures to preserve public health against things that really can be quite dangerous, like pandemics, really are best done commonly by uh, countries rather than singly by countries. We can abate a, a pandemic much more effectively if we do it together with other states than not. Mm -hmm. So the net thing I'm calling for in foreign policy is really quite a huge change, that we mm -hmm. uh, put aside the focus on containing other great powers and worrying about their power and limiting it, and focus now on two new problems. One is the danger of the threat from below, if you will, the uh, danger of WMD spread and terror networks combining. And the second is the dangers to the global commons, including climate change, but the larger collision between the human species and the natural world, and perhaps other areas of, uh, of, of um, uh, that where we, we use the jargon, the global commons, simply meaning a, a, a domain where uh, uh, um, w a number of countries or societies depend on it, manage it, and have to cooperate to preserve it, mm -hmm. uh, like the climate. And this is a big change. Our whole national defense establishment is really geared toward competition with major powers. Mm -hmm. You know, we build aircraft carriers and F-16s and killer submarines and so on. These things are really focused on great power competition. And I'm calling for a, a, a not to abandon that entirely, but for a refocus on these other problems, stemming WMD proliferation, uh, dealing with terror networks, addressing global commons problems. What will it take for the United States to shift their thinking around foreign policy to achieve that goal? Or is it possible? Well, I'm not uh, predicting that people are going <laughs> to salute smartly and carry out what I'm suggesting, because it would require a big change in US foreign policy thinking. Um, I don't want to sound too gloomy. I, I would say that, in fact, during the first year or two of Obama's first term, he 
spoke in terms suggesting a, an approach similar to this. He talked about the WMD terror threat as the primary security threat to the U.S., which I think it is, and he talked somewhat about other dangers to the commons. But he's now been reorienting his discussion of um, military policy toward East Asia, which really means toward a containment policy toward China, and I think that's a mistake. I think China has to be um, dealt with, but our long-term goal with China should be cooperation, not conflict. We need to lock arms with the Chinese and cooperate against problems that, that threaten us together. We are both severely and, and, and badly threatened by the prospect of weapons of mass destruction proliferation. China, like us, is threatened by uh, the terror threat. China is gravely threatened by climate change. We have all these common interests. I think uh, bringing the Chinese to understand that and forging some kind of common understanding on how to go forward is, should be the, the top goal. My analogy in suggesting this is to the period uh, after 1815 when uh, the European major powers pursued what was then known as the Concert of Europe. And it wasn't, it wasn't about the Boston Pops. <laughs> uh, it was uh, not uh, Jimmy Buffett. It was, uh, uh, the concert was, um, uh, uh, the name simply meant that they concerted their efforts together mm -hmm. to solve joint problems. Uh, and the main problem that they feared was sort of an ugly one. They feared revolution from below, and they worked together to essentially stamp out the smoldering embers of revolution and, and democracy, uh, and did it successfully. But as a part of that effort, they uh, did uh, things to uh, thicken their cooperation with each other and prevent conflict. And this succeeded for quite some time. Historians disagree on, how, disagree on how long, but the subsequent hundred years was the most peaceful hundred years in a while. Uh, and I'm saying we should think in similar terms of establishing a concert under American leadership in which the U.S. would have as a primary goal getting the major states of the world to focus together on solving these fundamental problems mm -hmm. that, that threaten us all together and that we, in my opinion, cannot solve unless we work together to solve them. Having some major disruption of great power cooperation on any of these fronts will be ruinous. We cannot solve the climate change problem if we have any major power sitting on the sidelines uh, uh, throwing stones uh, and not cooperating. As we have been. As, well, we have been, yes. <laughs> uh, correct. But we also have a problem with China and India, both yeah. saying, you know, yeah. neener, neener, you know, you made the mess, we won't help solve it, and so on. That, that, that attitude, our attitude has to change. So does China's and India's. Turning back to the question of containment for just a moment, um, Clint, I don't have a, a location for Clint, um, has posed the question, do you think Iran should be prevented from achieving a nuclear arsenal? That's sort of a containment question, right? Right. That's a huge question. It's the question of the moment. There's serious talk in Washington of using force right now to contain Iran. My view is I very much don't want Iran to get nuclear weapons. Um, my concern about Iran with nuclear weapons is a little different from the one we hear from our Israeli friends. Mm -hmm. The Israelis say, we fear these guys are not deterrable, they're not rational, uh, or the, you know, they will use the weapons on Israel directly. I think the chances of that are very small. But I fear that if Iran has these weapons, it's going to set off a domino effect of proliferation in the Mideast, that the Saudis will want them next, the Egyptians will want them. Once the Iraqis get their government more together, they will want them. And I fear that in the end, mm -hmm. some kind of domino chain like that will lead to a loss of custodianship. I do not trust the Saudi regime to keep these weapons secure, or the Egyptian, or just in general, if we have many countries with them, someone's going to lose control. So the nightmare here is that we're going to have too many cooks in the kitchen, the nukes are going to get out to the non-deterrable players, and once that happens, we don't have any answer. We don't yeah. know how to find nuclear weapons as they travel across borders. Mm -hmm. The problem of bringing them to the U.S. and detonating them, I'm sorry to tell you, is not that hard. So the front line has got to be keeping them out of the hands of bad actors. Mm -hmm. And that danger grows if Iran has the weapons. Not, as I said, I actually am not terribly concerned that Iran will either use them or will transfer them consciously to anybody. But I'm afraid of the... They won't protect the them well enough. It's a very unstable daisy chain of... Correct. And I'm actually less concerned about the Iranians losing control of them than about um, some, uh, of, the some of the other, like the Saudis have huge radical elements in their political system that, mm -hmm. are, that are close to Al-Qaeda. A lot of the funding for Al-Qaeda comes from yeah. Saudi friends of theirs, and good heavens, having nuclear weapons in Saudi Arabia, not a good, n not a happy scene. Mm. And let me just say also, he asks a great question, should we be worried? The second question is how to prevent mm -hmm. Iran from getting the weapons. Of course, I can't do justice to that question quickly, but I don't think force is the answer here. And I don't think that the U.S. has tried hard enough with other answers. Mm -hmm. We need to put 
uh, a serious diplomatic deal on the table for Iran, and we need to talk, 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 talk with them about what kind of deal that would be. And instead, the U.S. has had this very kind of hands-off, arm's-length way of dealing with the Iran problem for many years. And I don't think that deep, enduring international conflicts or issues are solved that way. We need to have a, um, a close discussion with them in which carrots as well as sticks are put on the table. Yeah, but to what degree do you think that um, that attitude of talking tough is a function of our own internal politics? I mean, that's kind of what drives people in that direction, isn't it? I think there's a chronic background bias that talks are something you do if you're weak and they're a favorite to their side. And I see that sort of an uh, assumption come forward, uh, you know, whenever we have a serious conflict with a neighbor or another country. And to me, it just misunderstands how diplomacy works. Talks aren't a favor to anybody. Talks are a way of persuading others, of threatening others, of accepting other people's surrenders. At the end of World War II, the U.S. <laughs> probably lost troops in battle because we could not organize Japan's surrender fast enough. And why not? Because we weren't talking to Japan. So talking is not, ne not being nice. Talking is a tool. Mm. It's an intelligence tool, too. You learn from, from mm. talking. So mm -hmm. this whole business of not talking to people because you don't like them, it's one of the most peculiar, persistent mistakes the United States has made over many decades. Is, you know, oh, we don't like you, so we're not talking to you. No, no, no. Uh, you should talk especially intensely with people you have problems with. Mm. So going to a different area of the world, John from Wilmington, Delaware asks, North Korea recently underwent a change in leadership. How do you expect this change in leadership will impact North Korea's ability to manage its nuclear arsenal? You know, you should have my uh, colleague Jim Walsh, who's mm -hmm. also in the Security Studies Program, uh, who is a r deep expert on uh, North Korea and on Iran. You should have him on here and have, okay. a, have, have a show with him, because he, he's very close to the problem. He's been to North Korea, he knows the players and so on. I, the, uh, the new regime is a mystery to everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, will it even survive? People aren't sure. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what kind of person is this? Mm -hmm. North Korea is like the other side of the moon. It's the most secretive society in the world. Uh, their elite, I think wisely, uh, uh, separates their whole governing establishment from the rest of the world. I mean, I, when I say wisely, it's because if their elites came west and saw how terrible their regime is compared to others, uh, this would undermine their loyalty to the regime. So mm -hmm. they, they live in a hermetically sealed bubble, which means we can't know much about what's happening there at all. Mm -hmm. So we just have some, you know, rumors about this fellow. It was very interesting the other week, I think it was a few days ago, that he, his, his regime came forth with an offer of some kind on the nuclear front to um, cut a deal, to uh, accept food and uh, um, freeze some of their nuclear activities. And it's a limited deal that they offered, but it was very hopeful. I thought, you know, it's very good if they're willing to talk about something. Maybe they'll talk about more. In the end, we want to freeze their whole nuclear program. We want to roll it back. So, um, but going I, back to that idea of talking. <laughs> yes, talking exactly. <laughs> even though they're very, they're, they're a cruel, odious regime. We should be talking to them, and uh, we have carrots and sticks to bring. And we should assume that they do respond to incentives. And um, uh, it, it may be. It may be unjust, it may be annoying, but it is true that bribery tends to work in situations like this. We should understand, we're a rich country, we can bribe people to behave better. Uh, like I said, food aid, <laughs> apparently they were responding to an mm. offer of food aid. Mm. Well, and they're so incompetent in the way they run their farm sector that they need food aid. Uh, mm. Let's exploit that, okay. Um, maybe we can uh, uh, make them with, with some, some carrots as well as sticks, can make them see uh, the benefits of behaving better. So I'm going to conflate two questions here, one from Bill in North Carolina and Caitlin from Stimson Center. Um, Caitlin asks, for nearly two decades, the U.S. has not been able to muster domestic support for global approaches to managing the world's commons. Can this be changed, and if so, how? And I'm going to conflate that with Bill's question about cyber threats, and I would add to that cyber opportunities, because I, I wonder if that might be part of the answer to Caitlin's question. Uh, these are both great questions. They're, they're kind of different. Uh, I'll, let me talk to Caitlin first. Um, can questions of the global commons be solved? And um, my short answer is very sobering to me, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, the, the most urgent question, climate change, in my opinion, has uh, policy solutions. Most, most, most importantly, a carbon tax, which I think would have benefits much bigger than its advocates say. 
It would bring forth whole new technologies and industries that we haven't imagined yet. We wouldn't be, we're not stuck with the current menu of possible answers to climate change forever. We don't mm -hmm. just have to think about geothermal, nuclear, and wind, and solar. Uh, if we would reprice carbon so that carbon industries, carbon energy would pay the full cost of the load it imposes on the world, that would make uh, uh, yet unknown green energies economically feasible. And you would see a burst of new investment in and discovery of new green energies. And we would have new menu options. Some of them would work. It would, it would be transformative. The, 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 the world energy complex, in my opinion, is very responsive to price. And if we would reprice carbon, we would once again finally put green energy on a level playing field and it would win. Mm -hmm. But the politics of causing that repricing to me look very, very difficult. Uh, I'll give you a, a bunch of reasons why this is almost the problem from hell, from a social science <laughs> point of view. Um, uh, years ago, it was recognized that the ozone layer uh, was in danger, and oh my gosh, how can we solve that problem? And that was fairly easy because the same industries that were causing the problem, creating chlorofluorocarbons, were the same industries that would solve it. You know, DuPont was mm -hmm. making the old mm -hmm. bad stuff, well, DuPont made the new good stuff. In this case, it's much tougher. We have I'll give you several problems. First, this problem pits a concentrated economic interest against the common interest. The concentrated interest being basically the carbon industry complex. Mm -hmm. In America, the concentrated interest almost always defeats the common interest. That's the way our political system works. Concentrated interests defeat common interests. And to, uh, to reverse that or to have a common interest defeat the concentrated interest it requires tremendous political will and leadership and uh, that has to be relentless. Second, this problem requires international cooperation, not just uh, a action by one mm -hmm. state. We need sort of wall-to-wall -wall cooperation, which is something that countries aren't good at, and organizing it is going to require very strong leadership by the United States. Uh, third, uh, this is a problem where the damage of the deeds you do today is delayed and therefore invisible. And our whole political system is geared only to solve problems that hurt now. If you go to Congress and say, spend money on a problem, but it doesn't hurt now. You know, it'll hurt in 20 years, and you'll be sorry, but it doesn't hurt now. Congress says, you know, really, pal, go away. I mean, I, I do things when things hurt. All right? Con Congress says, I'll fix it when it hurts. <laughs> and the problem is that that's just not an adequate answer for a problem that has this configuration, that mm -hmm. deeds done have delayed damage, not immediate damage. Um, and a fourth issue is just our, our moral traditions are, are lacking here. Uh, it's unfortunate that the Abrahamic religions don't really teach a duty to um, intergenerational uh, good deeds or to um, uh, the environment. Uh, you know, the, I, I often think, uh, would it be different if we had the Iroquois uh, general law instead of uh, the traditions we do have? But we have to work harder with our traditions. The Iroquois general law says you shall consider the effects of every deed you do down to the seventh generation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, live in harmony. Right. And uh, we, don't, we don't have kind of easy, shall we say, pull quotes or bumper sticker um, uh, ethical traditions that, mm -hmm. that, that highlight this problem. I, I'm, I'm going on too long, but the point is this problem of special versus uh, general interest, international cooperation, delayed uh, damage, um, these are all problems that make this a very difficult problem to solve for political reasons, not because there aren't solutions. Like I said, repricing carbon, that's a silver bullet that would change everything. That's why I was wondering whether or not it didn't intersect with the question about cyber threats and cyber opportunities somewhat, because uh, I wonder if some of the grassroots groundswell of opinion around some of these issues couldn't change the political realities of Congress. I mean, I, I know that that's not exactly what Bill from North Carolina was talking about with respect to cyber threats, but that made me think of cyber opportunities and, and uh, kind of the way Facebook was so instrumental in helping to create the Arab Spring, couldn't we create a, uh, I don't know. Well, you're asking, can social media be a way of aggregating the common interest of, uh, shall we say, uh, you know, the, the, the common folk? The, yeah. the, Not the leaving it in the hands of the politicians. Correct. Or into hands of special interests. That, that right. Everyone, all the stakeholders can now be more mobilized and, you know, come to a kind of common answer instead mm -hmm. of having just special interests be the loudest voices. I, um, it's a good question, sort of how does the new media really work? Uh, does, it, does it act as a forum where the common interest can be brought more for, further forward? Mm -hmm. And we have yet to see if that's really how the new media works or not, because it's an unformed dimension which bad actors can use as well. And, you know, you have uh, 
websites where uh, people without uh, members in, in, in a truth guild can, can spread misperceptions. But I, I share that hope that in the end, um, this is a communication tool that will help, you know, help bring the common interest, help make it easier for uh, all stakeholders to, to play in the game. Um, my main, though, when I think about the politics of all this, I think that um, there have been political movements in the past that have solved problems like this, and we should read some history books. And they did it, you know, pre-social media. Uh, above all, the civil rights movement in the U.S., which mm -hmm. was really a uh, brilliant um, movement for changing public opinion and alerting a huge swath of the country to a problem in a situation that it was really unaware of. You know, Dr. King's strategy mm -hmm. of, shall we say, public theater in the South was a way of um, uh, uh, changing how Northerners and many many Southerners thought about how things worked in the South. Uh, he used theater, and mm -hmm. of course, he was using new media then, mm -hmm. and very very mm -hmm. cleverly, he was understanding the 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 new potential for television in that case to be a channel for uh, communicating theater, which is what he was in the business of doing. Uh, so, you know, thinking creatively about how to use, and he, I think he was a genius in understanding that. One of the first people to understand how to use the new media to. Um, to communicate, uh, but uh, we, we've seen even older movements that succeeded in communication in ways that I think that the uh, environmental community could learn from. The anti-slavery movement, how, how was slavery delegitimated? De de it was done by entrepreneurs who understood how to communicate, and they mm -hmm. did it and succeeded at it. All right, I'm going to go back to uh, some of the questions that are being asked from uh, our audience. MD from Waltham sa points out, there's a distinction between rational states, France, failing states, Pakistan, failed states, Afghanistan, rogue states, North Korea, and rogue actors within any of these states. So long as failing and rogue states exist, we need to maintain some kind of containment as well as your proposed concert, correct? Yes, correct, MD. I have a simpler um, frame than you, I tend to divide all the actors out there, countries and uh, sub-state actors, into sort of two groups that are arranged on a continuum from deterrable to not deterrable. And uh, being less deterrable or more deterrable, what does it depend on? How aggressive are your aims? How clearly do you see the world? Do you, are you an elite that can uh, figure out how the world will respond to you or not? Uh, uh, do you value, um, uh, do you, are you cost sensitive? Uh, does punishment hurt to you or not? Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and uh, you can find examples and all, you know, the worst of the nightmare is uh, uh, an elite that are not cost sensitive, perhaps for some religious reason they think that, you know, everything, you know, the world ending is a good thing, uh, who perceive the world very poorly. For example, Saddam Hussein, who chronically misperceived everything, basically he would, you know, he would execute any of his aides who sort of gave him bad news. <laughs> Things aren't working out, pal. You know, dear Saddam, and then he would, you know, that person wouldn't be there at the next meeting. So Saddam was very hard to deter because he lived in a la-la land in which everything he did turned up rosy. Uh, or very aggressive actors, actors who were willing to pay a huge price to change the world, like Hitler was. Mm. Uh, and uh, the further you get on that non-deterrable dimension with any movement or country, the more trouble you're in. And I think a prime goal should be uh, preventing the arising of such movements. Now, MD says, do you need, he says, containment as well as a concert. I would use the concert, number one, to prevent the appearance of such mm -hmm. states and movements, and number two, to deal with them uh, if they do appear. Uh, with use the, the concert as the containment Yes, tool. in other words, yes. I mean, that's already kind of what we're doing in the counterterror area. People should understand that we have pushed Al-Qaeda back on its heels now, which we have done, with the cooperation of others. This is something we didn't do alone. We've had mm. intelligence cooperation from many countries in the world, mm. very important intelligence cooperation. Uh, we, we didn't f find all these bad guys and deal with them, you know, just because we have spies in the sky who can find stuff. <laughs> We've had very important intelligence cooperation, even from countries we normally think of as not terribly close to us. Mm. Uh, and we need to continue that and thicken it. Mm -hmm. So, Melody from Washington, do you think, uh, do you think nuclear weapons can deter all types of conflict between great powers, or only conflict that aims to prevent total conquest of other great powers? Uh, that's a, also a really great question. Um, I think of nuclear weapons as, uh, what, what they do to the world is they change conflicts 
from contests of capability to contests of will. Uh, if both sides can more or less harm the other uh, without limit, who tends to win a conflict? Mm -hmm. It's the side that cares more or the side that's perceived to care more because mm -hmm. that side will run more risks, will push things closer to the edge. If things actually go to war, they will take more losses. So uh, the uh, nuclear revolution is a, uh, um, a, uh, a, a, a change that helps those with, with stronger will, which is almost always the defender. Uh, a country defending its own territory and people and children can claim to have more will than an attacker who merely, you know, might want to conquer another just for some, you know, ephemeral reason. Conflicts that don't fit that pattern, though, over some third area, mm -hmm. uh, nuclear weapons don't solve um, mm -hmm. uh, because it's it, it, they, it can even be more dangerous living in a nuclear world where it's not clear which country cares more about a an issue. For example, India, Pakistan. One reason why that conflict's so dangerous is you have two nuclear powers fighting over an issue, Kashmir, where it's not clear who has the stronger will. And there's a serious danger that one side or the other could make a miscalculation and things could get out of control over that issue. Well, that's a great example, and I think we're going to have to leave it there. I feel like I could sit here and talk to you all afternoon, but I'm being told that our time is up. So uh, on behalf of the MIT Alumni Association, I would like to thank you. This has been uh, a delightful conversation or a uh, fascinating conversation, maybe not delightful, fascinating. Um, and I'd like to thank our audience for joining this interactive session. We encourage you to continue discussing these security issues on our blog, Slice of MIT, following the link uh, that will appear on your screen. Anyone who registered for this webcast will also receive a link to a short survey Please take a moment to fill, out, fill this out. Your feedback is important as we work to expand this programming. Thank you for watching. Our uh, intent is to hold these programs eight times a year. We hope you will join us for the next Faculty Forum online webcast to be held in the beginning of April.